Hello, good morning. Today our guest is Professor Robert Maisland. Hello, Professor Maisland. How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. So, Professor Maisland, you are known for writing some rather interesting papers. Sev I, I should not say several. A few years ago, I read your paper on coloniali colonialism produ produced by the Cambridge Journal of Institutional Economics. And I read it, all of it, even the references. And we're going to be talking about that paper, The Declining Effects of Colonialism. Robert, what motivated you to pin that article? Um, well, that's a good question. So uh, I've been interested in, um, in, in the literature on, on the determinants of economic growth for a long time, uh, especially on, um, on, on the institutional side of that. So the literature on the determinants of economic growth over the years has moved towards uh, more fundamental, more institutional determinants of, uh, of economic growth. So basically how the economy is organized, uh, what the legal system looks like, and those kind of things. Um, but uh, most of that literature then uh, has started to look at, um, at what's called the deep determinants of growth. Right, so the deep determinants of growth are basically the fundamental, long-term, uh, historically uh, determined um, variables that influence what kind of growth paths uh, people, uh, countries take, societies take over time. And I've been reading a lot of the literature, and um, what I noticed in the literature was that uh, there was always this argument that basically you had some kind of um, historical or geographical or what kind of uh, some kind of variable that influenced institutional uh, the institutional trajectory of a country and once on a certain institutional trajectory the argument was that um, that there's a lot of persistence there right so you have countries that have for some historical reasons, developed better institutions than others, or better in the sense of more growth conducive institutions. And those countries, and th these differences in institutions tend to be persistent, and therefore the differences in, in economic performance also tend to be persistent. Um, and there's a lot of evidence for all kinds of uh, deep determinants in the literature. Um, but one of the things that uh, struck me was that basically the, the, in, the, the, the middle part of this argument, uh, which is the fact that you have a shock or you have something happening in the past and you have an outcome now, and in between there's this persistence of these institutional systems, that there is relatively little empirical work um, that has been done on, on showing actually how how that works and how that evolves. So there's some empirical uh, sort of some theoretical work uh, being done. Uh, I think you um, in this series you also um, had, had a, an interview uh, with uh, with Bissin on this. Um, so there's kind of interesting theoretical work, but there's there's much less empirical work about how persistence actually works. And one question that uh, occurred to me, which is, this is basically sort of a longer term project, which is how persistent are these differences actually? So do these, uh, these initial differences, they, they matter now, but do they continue to matter in, in a sort of a, an equal way over time? Or is this effect declining or is it growing? Uh, we, we know very little about that. Um, so this was a larger project, and then um, I've, I've been working on, on this larger project for a while, and then it occurred to me that uh, sort of as, as a sub-project, it would be interesting to look at specifically at the impact of, of colonialism on, uh, on, on, uh, sub on former colonies, whether that the impact of colonialism, of uh, colonial era institutions, whether the impact of those on current day institutions and on economic growth, that impact is, is there. Uh, there's some literature uh, showing that these things are related. But the question is, 
is that impact uh, declining? Is it persistent? Is it growing? Uh, and that's that's an interesting question. That's a really relevant question as well, because if if that impact is is really persistent or it's it's really uh, or is it growing, then that um, that means that that the um, the prospects of these countries of countries with sort of adverse uh, conditions to start with are um, are much more problematic or more challenging at least than if these things uh, tend to fade over time. So I think that was, that was a really important theoretical, theoretical but also a really important practical question that um, that motivated me to write this paper. What an extensive response. You, yeah, you're quite about passionate <laughs> about the literature. Well, Robert, I'm passionate about the literature on colonialism because I live in a former colony, Jamaica, and I'm empirical. I don't like it when people say that colonialism was bad or that it was effective. I like the data. And uh, for years, I was reading articles that would not refer to data. So I started to do my own research. So I've written quite a number of pieces on colonialism, in particularly British colonialism, because Jamaica, Jamaica was under British rule. So Robert, were some colonial regimes better than others? Um, that's, that's a really tough question. Um, I think it, it really depends on, um, the answer to that question really depends on, on what your criterion is, right? So what, what kind of outcome you're interested in. Some colonial regimes appear to have been better at producing economic growth, right? But that's a very narrow outcome that doesn't tell you anything about whether they've been good or bad or, or even better or worse uh, about all kinds of other impacts, for example, uh, peace, stability, uh, inclusion, all these kinds of things, right? So, um, First of all, I would really like to stress that, right? So it really depends on what outcome you're looking at. And economic growth is, is, is really a very narrow, um, narrow outcome criterion. There is some evidence that some, um, that there are, I mean, it's obvious that there are differences in, in performance when it comes to economic growth between col former colonies and there is some evidence that these differences are related to uh, differences in type of colonialism. There's a uh, large literature there. I, so when I was reading your article, I saw the references in relation to the, wor the work of people like Laporta and other academics. Some academics quite a bit actually find a positive relationship between British colonialism and economic growth. What are your thoughts? Mm, well, I mean, empirically, there seems to be a correlation there, right? So empirically, there seems to be a correlation between whether you, uh, whether a colony had, was, was a part of the British Empire or, uh, or part of another empire. Um, and it seems to be that on average, uh, British former British colonies have fared a little bit better than uh, former colonies from other uh, from other empires. Um, the reason and the mechanisms for that, they they are less clear. They are less obvious. So, yes, the correlation is there. Why that is the case, it's it's not. Uh, people have been making different arguments, uh, but it's not, I, I, I think that the final word has not been said on that. Would you say that on average, the outcomes of British colonialism are superior? So some of the later papers are contending that the British promoted a decentralized system of education that was more responsive to local needs. So I've read people like Alexander Moradi and Dupras who recently wrote a paper for Cambridge. And I think that this literature is quite compelling. The French 
at the policy of assimilation towards elitists and place a premium on educating the best and the brightest, whereas the British from the date of the Industrial Revolution were focused on technical skills and, the, and market based skills. I think um, maybe in a very, I, I, from what I've seen, the, these are important channels, um, but the, uh, this, the, the dichotomy between French and British in this respect is, is really too simplistic, right? So there, there have been huge differences within the British Empire as well. Uh, so there are huge differences in, in the way they, they govern different po uh, colonies. Um, some of them were really hands off and some of them, the, the, the colonies that they, they considered more important, they, they were much more present there. Uh, and there was much more um, of, of a British influence. Uh, so to say the Brits had one type of model and uh, the French had a different one, that's, I think that's a, a little bit too simplistic. Um, in general, there, there was maybe a little bit of an, a stronger inclination in, in, the, in the British Empire towards, uh, towards adaptation to some extent, but probably that depended, that depended much more on, um, on the actual persons in charge and their context and uh, the possibilities that they had uh, more so than it was a, a really sort of a, so I, I think the difference there was more that in the, in the, in the British colonial system, probably um, British officers had a, a little bit more leeway, a little bit more discretion often than, um, than French colonial officers. Uh, and and there, that created maybe conditions to, uh, in some cases, um, make better decisions, uh, but also in other cases, make worse decisions. Robert, early in your paper, you point out the distinctions between indirect and direct rule Matthew Lange, his paper was cited and I read some of his papers a few years ago. In your paper, you are arguing that the literature is evolving. So originally, it was argued that indirect rule was more favorable because it left local institutions intact. Today, the argument is saying that direct rule imposed higher standards for for governance on natives and as such direct rule is superior what do you think about these arguments um again i think actually both both arguments um there's probably a grain of truth in both of them but i think that they are uh, fundamentally a little bit too simplistic because it, it it probably matters more how you do things um so what kind of indirect rule you have so if you have indirect rule so suppose you have a, a colony with um quite developed uh pre-colonial institutions that have been quite successfully developed and in that case um you get a uh you could you might use this basically this social infrastructure to to govern to govern a country however if you use the existing infrastructure you also um, sort of reproduce and uh, often amplify the problems with that infrastructure so um, indirect rule um, might have the advantage of leaving the social fabric intact right so it creates less disruption but that also means that it leaves all the problems in intact. So uh, differences in power and uh, corruption, maybe, or um, uh, strong inequalities, right? So um, that, that is the disadvantage of that. Um, 
personalized uh, ways of, of ruling uh, those, those kind of things. On top of that, I think actually um, sometimes indirect rule did not really make use of existing social infrastructure, but indirect so, uh, rule also sometimes made use of um, sort of invented this social infrastructure, right? So it, it sort of invented a pre-colonial situation that was not really there or was on, at least it was contested. And it, it, it gave it a status um, beyond what, what, was the, what it had before, um, which also um, uh, created problems uh, later on in terms of uh, ethnic conflict, for example. Robert? I am looking for an article on the political economy of colonialism. I know that Jutta Bolt and Lee Gardner, they have some really interesting pieces, but I want a piece examining the political economy of colonialism to show how natives interacted with Europeans to produce policies because natives also wanted to promote their own self-interest that were that work to the disadvantage of ordinary people. So there's a new paper out examining the relationship between colonialism and local corruption, but it's not framed along the lines of political economy. Maybe you should do such a produce such a paper. Yes, um, I, I agree. I, I think that would be interesting. It, it would be difficult um, to, um, I, I mean, there are papers like that. Uh, but these papers are um, basically case studies, right? So it would be difficult to produce a paper like that on a more um, empirical level. Wider scale, on yeah. a more, yeah. Um, we actually are working on a, uh, together with, uh, with Valentin Seidler of, the, of uh, Vienna University. I mean, I, I have been working for a while on a paper about uh, actually how, what kind of colonial officers in, in the British Empire existed in different places and how they interacted um, with, uh, with the local population and how they actually um, tried to, or not tried to, what they did to promote, um, to promote, um, sort of local capacity for running a bureaucracy uh, in order to prepare colonies for independence. Uh, so that, that's, that's a long-term project that I've been working on with, uh, with Valentin. Um, and I, I think that, that, that will be interesting and will probably answer some of your questions. But, um, yeah, I, I, I have uh, cited him, him before. I should have him on the show at some point. You should. Yes, yes I've, said, I've cited him in my own articles. But Robert, do you know what's interesting? Orlando Patterson is a distinguished academic and people like to talk about his books, but Patterson wrote a brilliant paper comparing the development of Jamaica to, Bar to Barbados and it is not frequently cited. I think it should be read. It's really serious because Patterson actually breaks down the differences in the institutional trajectories of Barbados and he in the institutional trajectories of Barbados and Jamaica and he notes that the Bayesians they have procedural knowledge whereas the Jamaicans have declarative knowledge and this is useful to your research it's really technical in Ireland there's a technical writer but it's surprising that even in J Jamaica people don't refer to this paper but it's somewhat of a milestone because yeah. he tells us exactly why the Bajans have done better than the, 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 the Jamaicans. Right. Um, yeah, so I, th I, th I think there's much to gain from, from studies like this, right? Um, and I think actually I, I, um, there's a, a similar study also comparing um, Jamaica to Barbados by Dawson. Yeah, Andrew, yeah. that guy. Yeah, uh, and uh, I, I, this is also a paper that I highly recommend, and I really like that. Um, um, which, uh, which actually I, I, uh, I teach to students um, regularly. Um, 
studies like these are, are really are really important. But as I said, right, so there is there is work being done in this in this respect. Um, but mostly it's it's these kind of case studies or comparative case studies. On a wider scale, it's it's difficult to make these kind of arguments. It's, it's also difficult to make the argument empirically that the British promoted civil society development in their colonies. Colonies. That's a popular argument, but I'm still looking for empirical studies. As you said, they are historical case studies. Yes. Yeah. But but I do know that during their time in Jamaica, they built many institutions relate, related to science and social development, but they don't exist anymore. The, 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 the Jamaica Journal is a legacy of colonialism. I think that's just still in publication, but it's not popular. But on a historical level, I can point to how they enable civil society development, but not on an, an empirical level. Now we're going to talk about some of your conclusions. British institutions. So in your article, you controlled for the impact of British institutions on African countries. So I looked at your hypothesis and that was one, how did colonialism affect institutional quality in Africa? What are your findings? Well, my main finding is, uh, my main findings are that there, that there are a number of determinants that have been in the identified in the literature that, that have been shown to be correlated with institutional quality and with economic performance uh, uh, through the channel of institutional quality. Um, so what I do in this paper is that I actually, I, I take this more or less as a given, I replicate those results, but what I try to, to do is to show how this effect, how this impact actually evolves over time. And my main conclusion, my main finding in this paper is that yes, these effects were there, have been there, but they are rapidly declining and um, by now they're almost zero or for some determinants they are zero, right? So they're no longer significant. They no longer have a significant impact on institutional quality. So yes, uh, the type of colonialism did matter for uh, the type of institutions that countries developed and that also had an impact on, on economic performance. But uh, the good news in a way is that these, this impact of colonialism is, is rapidly disappearing over time. Um, and that means that, that countries sort of, uh, it's what the results suggest at least is that countries sort of referred to a pre-existing more fundamental equilibrium. Um, now that the and, and that colonialism, the impact of colonialism, colonial regimes uh, is definitely there, but it was a temporary shock. That, that are your well. are your findings for economic growth also similar? Because they also controlled for economic growth. Yeah. So for economic growth, um, the findings are more or less similar, except that I not always find. Uh, find significant effects of these uh, of, of colonialism in the first place. Uh, so things are in the right direction, but they're not always significant at, at any point in time. And is there really a relationship between the duration of colonial rule and economic growth? Um, well, people have been arguing uh, that there is a relation like that um, and there is some evidence that uh, also in my paper there there is some evidence that uh, that there is a relation like that uh, but I think that the main the main point of, of my paper is not is that maybe that's not that interesting um, given the fact that whatever relation is there has, has disappeared by now. And Robert, why are these effects disappearing? Um, these effects are probably disappearing because there are um, there have been new shocks, right? So uh, there's there there is 
So basically the arguments of uh, institutional persistence are that you have intergenerational transmission of, uh, of, of institutions and all of the, the culture and the ideas that are underpinning these institutions. Um, but inter, inter, intergenerational transmission is of course never perfect. And uh, also countries, societies have been trying new things, of course, and they have been um, subjected to, to new uh, events, new shocks, uh, uh, changing conditions. So in a way, it's kind of natural to expect that uh, any effect that uh, any effect of a historical event of or even even of an historical event as uh, of a magnitude as, as colonialism was, um, it will wear off over time. Um, and, and that's exactly what I find, right? So there are arguments uh, also why you could expect that and, and these things won't wear off um, theoretically, but, uh, but that's, that's, that's apparently not uh, what, at least for, for these varietals in the context of, of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that's, that's not what seems to be happening. I appreciate these conclusions because they suggest that a country is not a slave to its past. Yes. And, and, and that's revolutionary. People that's can exactly evolve the beyond the legacy of colonialism, slavery, or the slave trade. Yes. So, so there is hope for economic growth and development. Some people like to argue that the legacies of colonialism are persistent. And the problem with this literature is that it undercuts agency. So if the legacy is so persistent, what you're really implying is that countries don't have the scope or the potential to develop. And this is untrue. Well, uh, I wouldn't go as far as saying that the country, that it would mean that countries don't have a scope to develop, but the scope is, is limited, right? So it's, it's a more narrow scope. And uh, so there, there is a, a certain, there's a limitation of agency in that, in that respect. And I think my paper shows that uh, uh, exactly as you say, right? Countries are not, societies are not necessarily the slaves of the past. Robert, this is, a tangential point. It's not in your paper or in any of your studies that I have seen or read. But ja Japanese, the, the, the Japanese also built an imperial empire. And I find it quite strange that when I'm reading articles or reviews of colonialism perpetuated by the Japanese, people are not as critical. I, as a libertarian, I'm not in favor of empire building and colonialism. However, when I read articles on the, the British or the Portuguese or the Dutch, they're usually negative, but in relation to the Japanese, the, the Japanese are being praised. I just find that really strange. It, it baffles me, I'm literally baffled. <laughs> um, I, I think there's, there's a lot of literature showing that um... Uh, being being highly critical of uh, of this episode in in Japanese uh, history, um, so I'm not sure whether I completely agree with uh, with your reading of the literature there. Um, more in general, I th I think so. Th the problem with uh, a problem with, with the literature in, in, in a field like this is that um, in many ways it's, it, it has been very influenced by the actual political economic conditions in the world, right? So a lot of this literature, um, a lot of the arguments that have now been put forward uh, about, for example, the superiority of British, uh, British uh, colonial systems, um, they actually is sort of you you can trace them back to um to colonial propaganda um, from the time of, uh, of of these colonial empires right so there is a large part in which these the, the literature um even today inadvertently sort of reproduces 
uh, ideas that were initially developed more to justify things like colonial empires uh, than, than to provide actual neutral assessments of, uh, of uh, what, what was going on. And in the same way, actually, you see you see something sometimes happening as sort of a counter movement against this, right? So, so uh, post colonial literature um, often um, often risks of doing the same thing, but in the opposite way, right? So, seeing everything through um, through the lens that 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 everything that was colonial was was necessarily bad. Um, and uh, in, from that perspective, um, you could see uh, you could see why um, why accounts of of uh, of East Asian rule, East Asian colonialism, like uh, Japanese colonialism, might be um, might be presented as 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 somewhat less problematic. Right, because it was also uh, if if you if you have a, a worldview in which uh, Western countries have dominated the world and it was a bad thing, um, then a non-Western country um, automatically has some kind of is is sort of attributed a, 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 some kind of moral uh, moral superiority, um, and I think that's uh, so. Ideas like this and sort of prejudices, biases like this, have they are still present in, in a lot of the literature on colonialism, and I think that that it, that is that's quite problematic. Yes, and in your conclusion, that is what you actually said. <laughs> you are criticizing both worldviews. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I read the paper clearly. Last point on the topic: pre-colonial institutions. Have you have you written a paper on pre-colonial institutions? Because in this paper, you know that pre-colonial institutions are becoming more crucial. Yes. Uh, well, I don't really prove that, but um, the, the, so the main conclusion, what what I what I show in this paper is that the effect of colonial legacies is disappearing, and I also present some uh, some evidence that this uh, this this is, is, is sort of happening with a co-occurring with a return towards the importance of, of more fundamental or previous uh, determinants of, of institutions in the performance like pre-colonial institutions but also geographical determinants. Robert, do you know what quite intriguing africa's oral culture so africans actually remember their story so people in the benin empire can tell you about the various obas even though the culture was not literate so contrary to contrary to what some actually argue africans are resi resilient because they maintain significant chunks of african culture yes yeah, they, they know their literature on the Obas and the Alafins quite well. And even today, African practices in Jam Jamaica are not unusual. Many of our stories and practices are a legacy of Africa. So J Jamaicans maintain significant chunks of Afro-Jamaican -Ja culture. And I think that's quite amazing, the importance of oral culture. So despite not having a, lit a literate culture, we still know quite a bit about the Benin Empire. I have, I have, a, P I have a paper on Oyo. It's, uh, the paper chronicles the constitutional monarchy in the Oyo em Empire and constitutional constraints. So some people think that Africans were despotic, but that's not the truth. In, in, in Oyo, they are laughing, was actually compelled to kill himself when he became tyrannical. You could give him like a cup, and if it was empty, he had to commit suicide. <laughs> yes, I find that quite unusual. But speaking to you has been a pleasure, and at some point, we're definitely going to talk again because you wrote a paper on the Protestant work ethic.
I think that's interesting and one on diseases and institutions or diseases shape institutions and economics, etc. But speaking to you has been a pleasure. The, the reason why I'm wrapping up is because I'm doing shorter shows. People like brevity. Okay. All right. So bye, Robert. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Have a good day. Okay. Bye. Thanks again.